Good morning. Good, sunny, warm, happy, celebratory morning to all of you. On behalf of the faculty, administration, and board of trustees, it is my privilege to welcome you to the 198th commencement of Emma Willard School. It is our tradition to permit the head of school a tribute to the class of 2012. So sit tight, it was a wild ride. There are 85 unique individual Emma girls in the class of 2012, each a distinctively diff brilliant voice in the universe. You unleash the considerable potential of your hearts and minds on Mount Ida and you leave us now as a memorable collection of polished young women of purpose and vision. Each of you has happily come to believe that you have a moral responsibility to give intelligently and generously of your uncommon strengths. There is Zoe, a gregarious thespian who relishes bold ideas. Courtney, a courageous shot putter with stomping feet and a bashful smile. Autumn, a self-aware, responsible steel magnolia. Resilient Linny, a diplomatic cellist who adores beagle pups. Calmly confident Wallace, a passionate poet with thrifty instincts. Sin Young, a true spark, an energy-conserving second soprano. Hallie, cheerfully unflappable, she conscientiously leads both people and all variety of animals. Camille, a fair-minded Vermonter and a bold editor, too. Flory, insightful, diligent, carrying both a tune and a camera. Denise, a natural teacher and a caring collaborator. Talia, an outdoorsy equestrian with sophisticated intellect and quiet grace. You hail from 13 of these diverse United States, from the Deep South to the Northwest, from New England to the Midwest, and California, too. You represent 13 other countries as well. Korea, Bulgaria, China, Ethiopia, Taiwan, Ukraine, Tanzania, Honduras, Bahamas, Japan, Botswana, Hong Kong, and South Africa. One of you speaks five languages already, and you are able to use your independent voices in Farsi, French, Mandarin, Arabic, Spanish, Cantonese, Bulgarian, Korean, Swiss German, Japanese, Setswana, Vietnamese, Thai, Swahili, Taiwanese, Greek, Ukrainian, Amharic, and of course, American Sign Language. There is Amber, a feisty, sprinting hoopster. She stomps and leads so naturally. Stephanie, an artistic and very fast cellist with the raw ingredients of a scientist. Our witty Chamberlain Becca, a confident, perceptive writer. Modest Kayla, an introspective Teen Vogue fan. Caroline Kay, a down-to-earth food guru with Midwestern charm. And Carolyn S., a sensitive leader all about helping others conquer their obstacles. Peggy, an intellectual sponge zestfully absorbing everything on the banquet table of life. Wandipa, a tenacious scholar with a desire to serve and quiet gravitas. Hella, a delightfully sincere and earnestly vivacious painter. Gian, a bright-eyed, insatiable learner whose hobby is thinking. Annika, an inventive photographer who listens well and rows hard. You are athletes running around life like a clown on purpose. There are 32 varsity athletes, nine of whom played two sports per year and two of whom were three season athletes. Six of you were recruited to be college athletes next year. Thanks to you, Emma launched an indoor track season and because of you, we became sectional champs in just our second year. You set a new pool record in the 4x400 relay, a new track record for the triple jump, 
and you led the tennis team to its first ever AA sectional championship. We have first team league all-stars in field hockey, basketball, tennis, track, and soccer. And one of you took soccer first team league honors all four years of your Emma career. There is the national champion in the girls' lightweight double in crew, the New York State champion triple jumper in both indoor and outdoor track and field, an NRA distinguished expert rifle marksman, a fencer, three competitive equestrians, two heading off to the prestigious U.S. Rowing Nationals, and one to the New Balance Outdoor Nationals, an Irish step dancer, the founder of a badminton team, and a young woman who can juggle while riding a unicycle. And can we count the launch of the Quidditch team? We will miss Kiana, a gifted linguist who explores, who loves exploring cultural forces. Eliane, a diminutive artist with big dreams and contagious optimism. Molly G, an intrepid and super conscientious tennis champ. Zveta, a pensive astronomer and a purposeful humanist. Scholarly Beatrice, a Category 5 tornado of diverse passions. Jay, an adventure-loving problem solver, graceful and independent. Celeste, an architect wannabe with can-do competence on both land and sea. Kotaha, Emma's Mozart, a gracious cultural ambassador who asks the right questions. Harriet, a songstress with an extraordinary aptitude for writing and making wrongs right. Ashley, a very musical bookworm. She toots the horn, pitches the javelin, and leads your class. Hattie, more than six feet of compassion, determination, and basketball passion. One of you plays 11 instruments. Another plays five. You could be an orchestra as collectively you play French horn, drums, viola, flute, violin, clarinet, cello, trombone, baritone, Chinese harp, guitar, bass guitar, piano, various percussion instruments, saxophone, and the sitar. A whopping 24 of your voices were in the choir, with 11 of you in choir, inner choir, and semiquavers. You were the ones who entertained us for the longest time last night at the concert. <laughs> Two of you attended the Manhattan School of Music pre-college program, and one of you has sung in a Carnegie Hall recital. There is resourceful Vipassana, an insightful thespian with a passion for all things theatrical. Logical Taz, effortlessly and awesomely creative, even with her hair color. Christine, an enthusiastic diva with pianist fingers and a scientist mind. Sophie, a voracious reader with genuine deep smarts. Meg, a humble violinist forging authentic connections between East and West. Andrea, a poised flutist who pulls her weight in the water and in the classroom, too. Annie Speranza, steady as a rock. She has oars, a hockey stick, and her act together. Lindsay, a passionate academic all-star in a triple threat athlete's body. Brittany, an indomitable oarswoman intrigued by wild animals. And Taylor, a mission-oriented organizational genius who thinks on her feet. 70% of you took an independent practicum during your Emma career. You made discoveries in the Emma archives, learned classical guitar, presented a paper at the World Food Prize Global Youth Institute, took classes with the Albany Berkshire Ballet, rode for the Albany Rowing Club, danced the tango, defleshed mammal carcasses at the New York State Museum, took Arabic classes, interned in Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's office, learned hip-hop dancing, wrote an independent paper on the Irish potato famine, and passionately pursued the sport of beagling. There is Mina, a scholar who draws with an eye for detail and an engaged heart. Maya, a sparkling burst of spunky energy who makes others feel significant. Maxine, 
buoyant and expressive with a killer South African accent and St. George's swagger. <laughs> Molly S., an athletic Wonder Woman, standing optimistically on high moral ground. Nicole, a scholarly songbird who adores both France and the courtroom. Emma Calkins, an original and musical poet who lives life outside the box. Lauren, a self-assured herald with panache and high standards. Jenny, the other herald, who brings real substance and sparkling wit to any conversation. Hannah, a racket-wielding star with an editor's good eye behind the lens. Kylie, a determined lifesaver with trademark positivity and a writer's creativity. You were ninth graders in 2009, 10th graders in 2010, 11th graders in 2011, and 12th graders in 2012. That won't happen for another century. Thirteen of you have Emma sisters. Eight are daughters of Emma girls. Two of you are the third generation of Emma girls in your family. One of you is a fourth generation Emma girl. And one of you, wait for it, is a fifth generation Emma girl. One of you was homeschooled for her entire schooling experience prior to Emma, and four of you will be the first to attend college in your family. Twelve percent of you are named either Sarah or Emily. <laughs> Emily Morley, her red hair has those fifth generation Emma roots. She exudes authentic warmth and physical power. Emily Younger, a scientific genius with a lovely voice and Chuck Taylor sneakers. Emily Mitson, a conscientious actress who loves living vibrantly out of, outside her comfort zone. Emily Che, an economist with global vision, keen on the intricacies of patterns. Sarah Barry, a cinematographer who adds the collaborative glue to any team. Gracious Sarah Brindle, a kid magnet with a responsible approach to life. Sarah Epstein, comfortable in the saddle, on starboard or port, with ample EQ and an easy laugh. Upbeat Sarah Bauer, a stellar center midfielder devoted to animal science. Compassionate Sarah Rahimi, a songbird with leadership gravitas. And Sarah Hankin, the ultimate Emma cheerleader, our generous, reliable editor-in-chief. In this class, there is no giving up when you are young and you want some. There is a licensed private pilot, a page at the 2008 Democratic Convention, one who has already earned actor's equity card points, and at least one who can design a wicked game of assassin. We have a talented Chinese brush painter, a poet who has published a volume of poetry in Ukrainian, one who has won a paid internship with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and one who has earned the Girl Scout Silver Award. One of you has traveled to Mongolia, Russia, Cambodia, and Vietnam providing free medical treatment with the Green Doctors Movement, while several of you led the school's launch of Audacia, a global forum for girls' education. We will miss Karen Cow, a persuasive entrepreneur with a passion for service. Yushi, an artistically gifted intellectual who appreciates complexity. Jung Min, sensitive but impish, a cellist with prodigious intellect. Annie Lung, Emma's health and wellness authority and a lightning quick thinker. Anton, born curious, a serene alto who tells stories using images. Raquel, a plucky goalkeeper who commits with smarts and heart. Karen Mull, a ballerina with proactive brain power and philanthropic know-how. Yana, a playful classic scholar with a hockey stick and an art historian's passion. Natalie S., a deep, spiritually can-do songbird with scientist's ambition. Detail-oriented Charlotte, a classical pianist with contagious energy. Lydia, inventive, sentimental. She can do the Irish jig and play the fiddle, too. You vowed in September to celebrate each Emma tradition with gusto, and you have... Captain Von Trapp brought the entire cast of The Sound of Music to the Triangle. And who knew his children were Asian? <laughs> Revel's delights included Yiddish-speaking kibitzers, avatar monks, 
two queens of Egypt, Justin Bieber, Harry Potter, Ron Wheelsley, the Occupy Manor movement, and a real live gargoyle. And thanks to the thoughtful class of 2013, each of you carry a piece of the Seagrid Triangle forever. You put the triangle online, your yearbook was bold, and you modeled teenage dreams in a teenage circus. We say goodbye to Clara with dancer's grace, self-reliant and unflappable. Mora, immensely likable, devoted to NPR and sustainable farming. <laughs> Vivacious Natalie M, running morning reports and 12 tones, running hard, period. Juan Juan, insatiably curious, deeply passionate, simply wantastic. Alfie's Emma's, Alfie, Emma's Puck, personable, playful, purposeful. Michelle, an upbeat alto who makes your soul smile. Agnes, an innovative humanitarian with comedian's charm. Josephine, deeply inquisitive, deeply determined. She will be a bioengineer. Julia, genuine and gregarious, unselfconsciously full of the best life offers. Campbell, an unconventional chem alchemist with a quick wit and dramatic flair. And Wanda, an athletic and intellectual fistful, never too busy to debate an idea or test an artificial boundary. Class of 2012, you may be assured that your voices and passions have left the mark of your individuality on this place. And we believe this place has left its unique brand of substance and good fun on you. Go now with our blessing and our thanks. Go forth knowing your dazzling energy is needed in this world. Trust that we will follow your journey with interest. Know that we will be proud. And remember, you are, in fact, what we think you are. You are golden. You are golden. Each fall, I meet with a committee of interested seniors to discuss graduation speakers. When I met this year's committee, I asked if there was a word that could become the theme for this special celebratory ceremony for their class. In less than 30 seconds, one senior said, philanthropy. I looked around the table. Heads nodded. This felt right to them, too. Philanthropy etymologically means the love of humanity, love as in caring for, developing, or enhancing humanity as what it is to be human or human potential. Enhancing human potential could be the tagline for the class of 2012. They have lifted us all with their endeavors, and talking about the love of humanity today will create a punctuation mark for their legacy. In your program, you will find the bios of our two speakers, but I want to introduce them individually by telling the story of why each was selected to share a message with this class. The habit of generosity is thoughtfully cultivated here on Mount Ida. Michael Colby Wadsworth, class of 65, our first speaker, is eloquent on that topic. Described in her college essay, yes, we do keep them, as someone who, quote, did not choose to follow conventional lines of thinking, end quote, she was also described as having a complex personality marked by sophistication, self-reliance, and an easily excited temperament. What Miss Picard, her college counselor, surely meant to say is that Michael is articulate, passionate, funny, purposeful, and most certainly unconventional. More important, she is a philanthropist in heart, mind, and soul. She walks the talk. A number of years ago, she helped Emma Girls create Phyla, an organization that teaches students how to be first-rate philanthropists. The concept is elegantly simple. She provides annual seed money, and the girls learn to give it away to local nonprofits. They learn that it's hard to give away money wisely. In the process, they also learn the love of humanity. They are changed forever. They are philanthropists for good. Any conversation about philanthropy at Emma Willard is more complete when Michael Wadsworth is at the center leading the chorus. 
Class of 2012, you have spent four years meeting in Wadsworth. Today, I would like you to introduce you to Emma's unofficial Dean of Philanthropy, the Wadsworth. Please help me welcome Mike Wadsworth. Thank you. Salute omnes. Greetings all. Graduates, parents, faculty and administration, Ms. Hall, Board of Trustees. Where are you? There you are. <clears throat> I am honored. I have laryngitis. I'm sorry. It's called a spontaneous catar. But I spoke with Madam Emma Willard, and she said, steadfast will. So here I am. I'm honored, thrilled, and a bit bemused to find myself standing before you today. Many, many people who were on this campus with me during my student years would be shaking their heads in surprise. Let's just say I was not the most obedient, well-behaved, docile girl on campus. That notwithstanding, I loved this school, love it still, and I certainly love all you young women. To demonstrate that, I want you to know that this is my grandson's sixth birthday and the first that I have not celebrated with him. So, and since the topic about which you've asked me to speak is philanthropy, would you give Owen a present? On the count of three, will you all shout as loud as you can, happy birthday, Owen. It's being streamed. He'll get it. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Owen. Great. Thank you. Now, on to topic, the real world, philanthropy, and you. I should tell you a, a bit of a story, and then I'll tell you a little more. When I graduated from Emma Willard, my father said something curious. At the time, I didn't really understand it. He said, Michael, the real world is not like this. You better figure out how to live in it. Well, I was 17, and, you know, I thought I could figure it out. <laughs> well, anyway. As Trudy mentioned, Ms. Hall mentioned, you're a class of students from 12 countries and 13 states, so one might say you already represent a great part of the world. You have demonstrated your participation in the real world through your actions, your interests, your clubs, phyla, audacia, internships, fair trade, green, and many others. These organizations have benefited from your concerns, your care, and your compassion. You have responded with energy, vigor, and alacrity to the devastations wrought by the earthquake in Haiti and the tsunami in Japan. I applaud you mightily for this, and my applause is mixed with awe. When I was a student here in the 60s, these gray walls really were protecting. You have made them porous. With apologies to the facilities committee. But you do still have a way to go before you have really entered the real world. You do not yet have full-time jobs, unless you consider receiving an excellent education a full-time job, and I do. You do not yet pay taxes, nor tuition, parents, nor tuition. You are not grappling with rent, mortgages, insurance premiums. Most of you have not yet voted in national elections, although I'm sure you formed your opinions. You haven't lost a job, nor stood in an unemployment line, nor personally found yourself financially responsible for catastrophic illness. Pestilence, famine, plague, misery, destruction, and ignorance are all part of the real world. Cheerful picture to paint, isn't it, as you're about to receive your diplomas and go out there? Well, what to do, what to do. What are you going to do? How can you live in and understand and make progressive change in the real world? One great way to tackle these problems is philanthropy. Just, the, just at this point, I would like to give you a little help in understanding what philanthropy is, at least as I understand it. Philanthropy, to me, is not charity. My working definition is this. 
Charity, to me, is good works with immediate, if not long-lasting, results. A soup kitchen is a good example of charity, filling hungry stomachs with turkey, mashed potatoes, and hot gravy. A wonderful way, no doubt, to give thanks on a special day. But, by Friday, hunger sets in again. Philanthropy, on the other hand, is the leverage by which the hungry person has the means to grow or acquire her own food. An important distinction, feed or help people be able to feed themselves. Now, here are some of my guidelines to help you along your way to being a careful and effective philanthropist. One, you do not need to be rich. You don't need to be Mrs. Astor or, oops, Mrs. Mellon. A hundred dollars can, ne- can mean nearly as much as a thousand or more. And you can find that hundred dollars. I play a little game with myself sometimes. When I see something I want, I ask myself if I need it. Oh, I can be very good at talking myself into needing a $200 copper tartan pan. But deep down, I know I don't. So I mentally save that $200 for a philanthropic cause. You'd be surprised how those dollars add up. More money for a worthwhile cause, and I can skip the way too fattening tart anyway. Two, a philanthropy must have focus. The real world, with its myriad hurts and needs, will ask for your help. Start thinking about what matters to you. Hunger in Africa, domestic violence, AIDS, education. I'm looking at you meaningfully when I say education. Let me put it another way. If you go to a pet store or an SPCA, you will see adorable puppies and sweet little kitchens, kittens, all of whom need a home. They will open their eyes wide and wag their tails, hopefully, and you cannot adopt them all. Um, you can't give them your care, your attention. You can't even afford all those vet bills. Focus. If you want to support education, let that be your mandate. Parenthetically, I need to insert that education is a big part of many, many solutions. Three, passion. You should care deeply about your cause or causes. If you think you should get involved in something, let's say, trendy or flavor of the month, or you should get involved because your best friend or partner or daughter supports it, think long and hard before you agree to jump in. I've jumped in without really looking first. I've served on boards. I've given money. I've asked for money only to find out I don't really care about the cause that much. It becomes strangely demoralizing for me and a big letdown for the institution I promised to care for. But just watch me if I do care. Relentless. Dog with a bone. Ask my husband. He'll be glad to tell you what it's like when I get involved. Sustainability. And I mean that in two senses. For you personally, if you are committed and passionate, your own participation will sustain you through what most likely will be a long haul. And a great deal of what you should be looking for in the institution or cause you have adopted is sustainability on its part. A nice tight example of this would be the Emma Willard School Endowment. Well, you knew I was going to get around to this, didn't you? By supporting the endowment and its sister, the Emma Fund, you give the school a constant source of income that enables the school to afford specific programs, pay for campus maintenance, address the rising costs of goods and services. More about that later. Homework. Study the institution or the cause. Look long and hard at the grant, which is essentially the institutions ask. Learn to read the financials or find someone else who can. My husband is very good at this. He's lost a lot of sleep because I keep him up all night long going over spreadsheets. Isn't that romantic? 
Look at the board and the administration. Read the mission. Ask questions. Think of it this way. It's your money. Who's spending it and how? Speak up if you don't understand or you disagree. Having said that, let me add a note of caution. Once you've made your decision to offer your support, avoid the temptation to micromanage. You have read the mission. You've educated yourself about the financials and the workings of the organization. You're satisfied with the team. Let them do their work. But, of course, stay involved. It's a balancing act for sure and one I'm not always so good at. <laughs> Back to the real world. Um, that real world that my father told me about, I found myself there. Um, I was a divorced widow with two children standing on the West Division Street of Chicago unemployment line collecting my $126.50. I thought at the time, hmm, this is not going to go very far, and I have two children and rent to pay. Uh, it was a down, down, down time for me, and I'll tell you, in all honesty, what got me through it, I went to Emma Willard School. I believed in myself. You all have that advantage. You will face the real world with strength and conviction. In just a little bit, you will be leaving this campus and entering another, that cheerful place I described, the great big global campus. If you were paying attention, you have, made me, you have heard me use the word educate and education. That was deliberate. I cannot leave you without making a pitch. The twin sister of philanthropy is fundraising, and I do a lot of that too. You are graduating. You are soon to be our alumni sisters. I want you to remember something very important. I'm going to tweak the old expression about charity and say that philanthropy begins at home. Your experiences here from your classes and your clubs, your scholarships, your rooms, your meals, the windows you looked out of and into, the entire workings of this school have always depended on the philanthropic generosity of thousands and thousands of Emma Willard alumni, parents and friends who have given millions and millions of dollars for nearly 200 years to sustain the remarkable legacy of Madam Emma Willard's vision. Just recently, those, and I get crying here, just recently those alums, parents, and trustees gave over $75 million to the Emma Willard endowment. In large part due to that extraordinary outpouring, you young women will go out into that real world with the excellent education, the awareness of need, the strength of conviction, and the courage to serve and shape your world. With your support, generations of younger girls will follow you. We who came before you answered the philanthropic call for you. Answer that call for the future students. Oh, and since I chair the Emma Willard Board of Trustees Development Committee, I'm probably going to be the one on the phone. <laughs> now, I'm known for the snail jokes, and I have time, so I'm going to end with my snail joke. You may think right now it was a long haul getting here, but I promise you, as soon as you walk out the campus, you will realize that it went by very quickly, and it'll hurt a little bit. Well, my friend the snail. The snail was robbed by a turtle, and when the local police came along to get a description of the crime and get the details and whatever, he asked the snail, can you give a description of the perpetrator? And the snail said, no, it all happened so fast. Get out in that real world and make a change. Thank you. You may have noticed she brings both her passion and her humor to the board meetings as well. Our second Emma speaker is someone we just met this year, 
as Emma Willard was practicing walking the philanthropic talk as an institution. We hosted Audacia, a three-day global forum for girls' education that showcased best practices in programs and philanthropy that hold promise for eradicating barriers that prevent girls from receiving an education. On the second day, Catherine, then a doctoral student at Berkeley, she has since completed her Ph.D. just last week, took the stage with Kavita Ramdas, the former president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women. Their session was called A Just Education, Just Because Girls Matter. Although internationally renowned Kavita was billed as the headliner, Catherine quickly took center stage with her argument that girls deserve an education simply because they are human. She introduced us to a notion she described as the feminization of obligation and had us all examining the political rationale for the girls' education movement. It was spellbinding. It was memorable. Several members of the class of 2012 saw her in action and knew any message about the love of humanity from Catherine would resonate here on Mount Ida. It turns out that we learned her husband is associated with the fair trade movement, so this is indeed a perfect match for Emma. Please welcome our new friend and intellectual powerhouse, Dr. Catherine Moyer. Thank you. Greetings, Emma Willard, class of 2012. I am honored and humbled to be with you here today, and I am filled with the same feelings of joy and hope that you must feel. I am a recent graduate myself. Last Sunday, after a long journey, I completed my PhD. My family and friends gathered from all over the country to wish me well and to send me on my way just as yours have come here from all over the world to celebrate you and to cheer you and to wish you well. This is a day to celebrate, but also to be grateful for the intellectual labor, the unconditional love, and the care and support of our families, friends, teachers, administrators, staff members, and the communities that have brought us to our graduation days. This is a day when we recognize that there is comfort in familiar people and places, but the time has come to leave people who have nurtured us and places that have felt safe for us. And so this is a day when we imagine new pathways into the world and journeys into history. Yours is a generation of great hope in the midst of mounting challenges and divisions in our country and in our world. Thus, it is fitting that your class requested graduation remarks on doing good. Your request reflects your idealism and speaks in profound ways to our historical moment. I think back to a graduation a number of years ago when I sat crammed between restless siblings and delighted parents at a University of California Berkeley commencement ceremony. I listened as feminist literary critic Gayatri Spivak, a professor at Columbia University, asked the question, how do we do good to others? As her powerful words gave way to the soft cadence of the graduates' names, I reflected upon my own evolving answer. I realized that this question has deeply informed my educational and professional choices. And yet, her simple question is complicated. It is an ethical question, and as she warned, it comes with myriad competing and often contradictory responses that demand careful intellectual and practical attention. So I thought that today I too would ask this question. More specifically, I would ask, how do we do good to other girls and women, those we may never know? This is a question that you, as individuals and as a community, are already asking, as evidenced by your school's commitment to supporting girls' education in the global arena. You are concerned about doing good to others, and you are thoughtful about doing good to other girls and women in particular. I had the great privilege of speaking at your school's forum, Audacia, last fall in New York City. That gave me the opportunity to learn about Emma women, your traditions and expectations, your fierceness about your educations, and your willingness to speak freely on things that matter. 
you as emma graduates come from a long lineage of women who recognized and often audaciously not accepted their expected place in the world these women are part of a bold history they understood that as with all differences be they racial sexual economic linguistic or religious our gender influences but does not necessarily determine our place in the world you and i have received or rather claimed an education that brave women and men have fought for and even died for emma willard almost 200 years ago demanded that young women receive an equal yet distinct education to realize their full potential within a world that had placed constraints on them because of their gender. During the civil rights movement, the Little Rock Nine, a courageous group of black boys and girls in Arkansas, demanded a fair and just education for all in the face of racially segregated schooling. Today, girls in Afghanistan walk to school braving the dual threats of a global war on terror and a fundamentalist religious war. While in Connecticut, a homeless woman was arrested for giving her child an address in a privileged suburban school district so that her child might receive a quality education. How does a woman without a home guarantee an education for her child? As these examples across time reflect our gender, race, religion, class, and other differences affect our educations. I, like you, have been given an extraordinary education. And I have learned that a privileged education cannot be taken for granted, and that it comes with a set of responsibilities. Among them is doing good to and for others through service, volunteering, philanthropy, community organizing, and in our intellectual and professional work. Doing good is a profound opportunity that demands careful attention, particularly in an ever-globalizing world, complicated by unequal and often invisible relations of power. From what I have learned about young women at Emma, you are engaged in issues that matter to you and to our world. Poverty, hunger, global trade, labor rights, prison justice, climate change, deforestation, water, human rights, and peace. Over the course of our lives, I imagine that different issues will tug at our hearts and send our minds spinning. I am inspired by my mom, who at the age of 65, has become profoundly concerned with the rights of immigrants and the hostile conditions of our nation's southern border. With a broad coalition of others, she's engaged in transforming the racist, violent climate that exists for those who are undocumented where she lives in Tucson, Arizona. I have been drawn to education. I am a teacher, and I imagine, like your Emma teachers, I love classrooms, and I admire my brilliant students. When I returned to graduate school, I specifically focused on girls' education in the global context as an issue of equity and justice. As I soon discovered, educating girls is a hot topic on the global stage. Government leaders, corporate CEOs, and activists are all carrying the banner of girls' education. In fact, girls' education has become, for many, a panacea. By educating girls, we will solve all of a country's social, economic, and environmental problems. It is imagined that educating girls and young women creates a ripple effect, reducing poverty, increasing economic productivity, improving child and maternal health, decreasing population, controlling the spread of HIV AIDS, and in conserving environmental resources. Imagine the responsibility that places on particular girls and young women. What I am interested in through my research are the assumptions that inform these investments and the consequences, intended and unintended, of framing our work with girls in this way. I spent two years in the U.S. and Brazil trying to understand how U.S. corporations and their foundations, in particular, are investing in girls' education. I specifically looked at the programs of the Nike Corporation and the Nike Foundation. 
and I observe that these programs and policies target girls and women for purposes beyond serving them, positioning them as means rather than ends, with the ends being what they will do for poverty, the economy, the environment. While solving such problems is indeed legitimate and important, my research has uncovered the ways that this shifts the burden of development onto girls and young women. It's too much to ask of them, positioning them as disproportionately responsible for themselves, their families, their communities, their nations, and the multiple problems and contradictions of development. And yet, this logic circulates everywhere, from the State Department to the World Bank to small non-governmental organizations. The language of such investment taps girls in much the same way as investments in natural or physical resources. Consequently, many talk about investing in girls as they talk about drilling untapped oil reserves or unleashing solar technologies in the language of maximizing returns on investment. And so what is the consequence of this? When the focus is on returns, efficiency, and calculating gains to GDP, what become marginalized are programs that promote girls' education as fundamental to equity and justice for those who have been historically denied in education, democratic citizenship, and human rights. What emerge instead are forms of education emphasis on girls and young women as reproductive and economic actors. This leads on one hand to a strong focus on pushing back the age of pregnancy and marriage as opposed to focusing on sexual and reprodu reproductive rights and responsibilities, and on the other hand, to a focus on the acquisition of economic assets and the promotion of economic skills. When we think about educating young people, these are very limited goals. Why is it when we talk about other people's children, to use a phrase from educator Lisa Delpit, do we marginalize all of their other capabilities and forms of potential. How might we con contrast these instrumental goals with Emma Willard's goals for girls' education? At Emma, you all have been educated to be learners, critical thinkers, and knowledge producers. And you have been taught to be self-reflexive, conscious citizens of your communities and our world. And most important, you have been educated as an end in and of yourself. You are not a means to achieving a whole set of other outcomes defined by other people in other nations. You have been educated because you are you, unique and brilliant. What if when we imagine the education of every girl everywhere, we imagined it to look like an Emma Willard? What if when we discussed educating girls and young women in Kenya and Ethiopia, in Brazil and Guatemala, in China and Afghanistan, we focused on them as learners with diverse needs, desires, conditions, and undetermined futures? I ask you to imagine the fundamental idea that girls' education should be promoted be because girls matter in and of themselves rather than as their potential value as instruments of development change. Ensuring equal access to a quality education for all young people, regardless of gender, race, sexuality, caste, class, and nation, should be at the core mission of all those concerned about human rights and justice. All of this, to me, argues that for us to do good to others, and specifically to other girls and women, we must consider a critical philanthropy, one that is based on deep intellectual labor, purposeful questioning, critical self-reflection, and an understanding of our relationship to others. I propose this because I'm weary of what I might call fast philanthropy. We live in a world where you can do good in faraway places with the click of a mouse, giving a uh, collective of women a microloan or buying a t-shirt to support girls' education. While there is something powerful about this moment of globalization and technological promises, there is also something that moves us farther away from those we help, whether they are proximate neighbors or distant others. 
Don't get me wrong. I have a very strong sense of doing good to other girls and women, but I have come to understand that there are deeply unequal relations of power that mediate my relationship with the women I loan money to or the girls I aim to empower. Despite my own good intentions, I can reproduce uneven equal relations of power if I do not engage in a critical philanthropy. Thus, as all of us go out into the world, whether we do good in communities we come from or on distant shores, there are a few ideas that I think we can carry with us. I am confident that these are habits of hearts and mind that you have developed and strengthened here at Emma Willard. First, do the hard work, the intellectual labor. It is easy to get carried away by our own genuine warm feelings about doing good so much that we fail to give it the careful intellectual attention that we give other actions in our lives. Sometimes we need to ask difficult questions. What is the history of an issue? What are its compounding factors? What are the cultural assumptions we are acting upon when we address it? Second, look for the unintended consequences. When there is a chorus of voices all saying the same thing, and everyone is moving in the same direction, it is easy to forget that doing good, like anything else, has consequences, intended and unintended. We have been educated to have critical minds, and therefore we must consider the unforeseen effects of our own good intentions. Third, through all your explorations, keep learning about yourselves. Doing good is a gift to yourself as well as to those you serve a gift for you to consider who you are um, and how you relate to others. And it necessitates that we carefully look at our own privileges, gifts, and capabilities, not as an exercise in self-absorption, but as an investigation of our own places in the world. Finally, consider the interconnected nature of our world. We have the responsibility to realize the difference between helping others and doing good to and for others because our lives and shared futures also depend on it. As Lila Watson has said of her collective work with Aboriginal peoples in Australia, quote, if you have come to help me, go home. You are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Thus, whether we are working in another country or in our home communities, we have the same responsibility to ask critical questions, to investigate the consequences of doing good, to continue learning about ourselves, and to understand our relationship with others. With these ideas in mind, the received wisdom is that supporting the education of girls, just like us, all over the world, very well may solve all kinds of problems. But we must first remember that all girls deserve educations because, first and foremost, all girls matter. And right here and now, on this glorious day of celebration, nobody matters more than you. Congratulations. Your world is waiting for you. Thank you, Dr. Muller. I know that Madam Emma Willard is smiling down on you right now. Did we come here to do something today? Oh, yes, right, all right. <laughs> the diplomas will now be conferred by Anne Dupre, Class of 73, Chair, Board of Trustees. Um, what I should tell you is um, we have a very interesting tradition here. We graduate in order of height and not alphabetically. So space is provided over here for you to take a picture of your daughter as she graduates, but could I ask that you remain seated until a few before your daughter go up and then you can leave some room for others over there. Class of 2012, the best part of being chair of the Board of Trustees is that I get the honor of presenting each of you with your diploma. And I want you to know how incredibly proud all of us at the school are of you today. Over the last few years, we have rejoiced in your performances, 
on the stage, on the playing field, and in the classroom. We have shared your tears and your fears as you struggled in exams and in the college application process. And we have watched with pride and wonder as you have overcome obstacles, gained confidence in yourself, and developed into the accomplished young women that you are today. As you prepare to leave us to begin this next chapter in your life, we wish the following for you. May the friendships that you have forged here continue to thrive. May you build on the gifts of knowledge and new experiences that this school has given you, and may all of your dreams become reality. Ashley Nicole Bowen. Molly Rose Shapiro. Michelle Marie Jerez. Margaret Megway Smith. Young Elian Chung <laughs> Molly Medoff Goodman Carolyn Grace Sidford. <laughs> Rebecca Allison Piner. Lenny Rose Kapner. <laughs> Kotaha Takashima. Natalie Elizabeth Smith. <laughs> Jane Beatrice Lee. Karen Coe. Karen's father, Emmanuel Coe, trustee, will present her diploma. Emily Rose Elmstrom Younger. (laughs) 
Yu Jung, Emily Che, cum laude. Karen Elizabeth Arnold Mull. Emma Ray Bennett Calkins. Jung Min Kim, cum laude. <laughs> Vipassana Tara Green. Vipassana, Vipassana, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Hannah Rose Haight, Hannah's mother, <laughs> Hannah's mother, Amy Williams, class of 78, and her grandmother, Patty Williams, class of 50, will present her diploma. This is a first girl. Hallie Elizabeth Skripak Gordon. Hallie's mother, Pam Skripak, class of 80, will present her diploma. Nicole Elizabeth Rattel, cum laude. <laughs> Natalie Grace Griffith Munderville. Jenny Nikoleva Georgieva, cum laude, E.W. Autumn Marie Hinton. Kylie Elizabeth Grandjean, Kylie's father, Brian Grandjean, member of the staff, will present her diploma. <laughs> Caroline Elizabeth Esselam. Carolyn's aunt. <laughs> Carolyn's aunt is Chris Carroll, long tenured member of the faculty and birthday girl today. <laughs> Sarah Moira Rahimi. Sarah's mother, Diane Drew, class of 67, will present her diploma. Thank you. Thank you.
Peggy Peiting Hu, cum laude. Ji Young Chun, cum laude. Jin Young Charlotte Shing. Raquel Medina Schmidt. Sin Young Park. Tessa Lee Holiday. Lydia Jane Youngman. Yushi Zhao. <laughs> Lauren Larton Christensen, EW. Harriet Ponder Zucker, cum laude. <laughs> Jujing Wan Wan Fei, EW, cum laude. Hattie Ingeborg Rose Coles. Andrea Claire Toomey. Florentine Ann Stope. Flory's mother, Reed Stope Sloan, class of 80, will present her diploma. Maya Johnson, Miani Johnson, former trustee, will present her diploma. Thank you. 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 Ch 
Chu Yin Agnes Lee. Maxine Paola Kannemeyer. Mora Elizabeth Ebel. Hella de Bebe Hapwell. Zoe Gabrielle Chachimovitz. <laughs> Denise Mesa Reyes. Julia Rose Ryback, E.W. <laughs> Anton Liu. Alexandra Louise Hunkowski. <laughs> Taylor Lee Garrison, EW. Talia Rose Zisman, cum laude. <laughs> Yana Maria Recco. Lindsay Mariah Patterson, E.W. <laughs> Sarah Emily Bauer, Sarah's mother, Ann Crotty, class of 83, and Aunt Aaron Crotty, class of 84, trustee, will present her diploma. Sungmin Wang Cum Laude. <laughs> Sarah Jordan Hankin, EW. Sarah's mother, Laura Bostic Hankin, class of 78, will present her diploma. Sarah Elizabeth Ruth Epstein, Sarah's father, Glenn Epstein, trustee, will present her diploma. Thank you. 
Brittany Nicole Cuff. Clara Louise Dollar, Clara's mother, Susan Poison Dollar, trustee, will present her diploma. <laughs> Josephine Richard Masandika. Sarah Elizabeth Barry, E.W. <laughs> Camille Ann Shaw Pigeon. Annika May Lung, cum laude. <laughs> J. Elizabeth Molino. Vitlana Yukomovich. Amber Loretta Spencer. And also celebrating her birthday today, Sarah Kathleen Brindle. <laughs> Kiana Elizabeth Ascari. Wallace Augusta Mead. <laughs> Wanda Noonan. Han Yang <laughs> Anne Lafleur Speranza, Annie's mother, Margaret McKelvey Speranza, class of eighty two, and her grandmother, Nancy Woodrow McKelvey, class of sixty, will present her diploma. Celeste Fitzgerald Pompucius, cum laude, E.W. <laughs> Emily Frances Mitson.
Courtney Danielle Garvin. Annika Sarah Bernard. Emily Ann Morley. Mary Campbell Alexandra Hegel. Wandupa Latoya Mulape. The class of 2012. In 1994, to honor Jameson Adkins Baxter, a member of the class of 1961, and to acknowledge her extraordinary commitment to Emma Willard and the education of young women, the Board of Trustees established the Jameson Adkins Baxter Award. As president of the Board of Trustees from 1987 to 1994, winner of the Distinguished Alumni Award for Service to Emma Willard, and the 1999 recipient of the Tangeman Medal, Mrs. Baxter magnificently represents the ideals of the school. Her love, vision, and spirit continue to bless Emma Willard and inspire one and all. The Baxter Award is given annually to the senior class member who has shown the most growth during her years at Emma Willard and who embodies the integrity, discipline, and commitment to education, her own as well as that of others, that are so evident in Mrs. Baxter. The accomplished and poised seniors sitting before us today, it may surprise you, were not always such intellectual thoroughbreds. Years ago, they were mere academic yearlings, tripping over their own feet and unsure of their gait. This year's winner of the Baxter Award once worried that she would never hit her stride. But she had a great example to keep in mind. She was inspired, in her words, by a role model who I not only strive to emulate every day, but who I also venture to make exceptionally proud of me. That role model happened to be an Emma graduate from the class of 1990. Arriving at Emma as a 10th grader was eventful for our award winner. It is hard enough to jump on a train that began a journey a year before you arrived. It is harder still when that train is moving faster than the one you have been riding but she kept her positive focus. Her biology teacher wrote that, I quote, she never took her progress for granted. While her US history instructor noted, she is a wonderful person who gives 100% all the time. 
Challenge reveals character, and character is this young woman's conspicuous strength. This is best demonstrated by her selection to head the Conduct Review Committee, a leadership position here that requires, in the words of the group faculty advisor, maturity, diplomacy, wisdom, trustworthiness, emotional intelligence, objectivity, fairness, and common sense. This year's winner has these qualities in abundance. Outside of Emma, this young woman pursues her passion for the age-old sport of beagling. <laughs> it has been in my family for decades, she explains. The pack of hounds has been passed down to me, and someday I will pass it on to a future generation. Guiding a committee at Emma is one kind of challenge. Caring for a rambunctious group of dogs requires extra degree of patience and love. And this woman has an uncommonly full and good heart. Our Baxter Award winner once wrote, quote, I think education is so important because it is the beginning of a success story. It is immensely satisfying to see this young woman begin her success story and to celebrate the success she has become at Emma. We are proud to present this year's Jameson Adkins Baxter Award to Lenny Kapner. Tangement Award. It is my privilege to invite Aaron Crotty, class of 84, trustee and past president of the Alumni Association Council, to the podium. Thank you. <laughs> Here I am. The Clementine Miller Tangement Award was established in 1973 by the Alumni Association to honor Mrs. Tangeman, a member of the class of 1923, who in her lifetime of service to her alma mater served as honorary trustee president of the Board of Trustees, and a member of the Alumni Association Council. The award is presented annually by the Alumni Association to that senior who best exemplifies the spirit of enthusiasm, dedication, and creativity that characterized Mrs. Tangeman's involvement with Emma Willard. It is said that one should not judge a book by its cover, but what if the book has a radiant smile and contagious good energy? then yes, judge this book by its cover, knowing that what is inside is well worth reading. The first books that interested this young woman might well have been cookbooks. Her mom gently notes that these first efforts were, oh, sorry, sorry, wait a minute. At a tender age, she was determined to prepare a meal for her family. Her mom gently notes that these first efforts were, well, less than savory. But our tangible winner was not deterred. She kept trying, and eventually she produced marvelous meals. This has been her approach to life. Create a feast where others merely snack, experiment boldly, learn from mistakes, and celebrate success. Like any great book, the narrative of this Emma girl's life is full of variety. Is she an athlete? Absolutely, for she plays field hockey and lacrosse. Is she a leader? Very much so. Serving this year as a proctor? Is she engaged in clubs? Yes, again, with a particular passion for the environment, for she helped lead the effort to build a garden on our campus and install solar panels on the science building. Could she possibly have time for music? Why, of course. She plays in the orchestra, sings in the school choir, as well as 12 tones. All these activities add to an already rich history. Reading her life, you will also find a chapter on her superior work in math that took her to our most advanced course. There's a chapter on her serious focus on nature that led her to double up on 
science this year, and still more chapters on her achievements in French and English. While the book of her life is far, far from finished, early reviews have been great. Critics, well, her teachers anyway, have raved about her passion, her intelligence, her lively class presence, and her positive attitude. Looking in the appendix, you will find a whole separate story on her junior spring, which she spent away from Emma, learning and living in the high mountains of Colorado. It was a terrific growing experience for her, but left a void in our community and a hole in our hearts. If this young woman really were a book, she would be a bestseller. It is with pride and pleasure that we present the Clementine Miller Tangeman Award to Julia Ryback. Each year, the senior class chooses a member of the class to deliver the senior address. But the class of 2012 had several twos in it. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce two speakers today, Shei Jing Wan Wan Fei from Shenzhen, China, and Pei Ting Peggy Su, a diehard from Taipei, Taiwan. Thank you, family, friends, faculty, staff, and administrators for coming to our graduation and for the welcome. I'm Peggy Xu. I'm Wan Wan Fei. <laughs> when we first heard from our president, Ashley, that we were the speakers, our reactions were like this. <laughs> and 10 seconds later. <sighs> Honestly, we were already honored to be nominated and were not expected to be chosen at all. But since you have chosen us, we were determined that we could not let you down. <laughs> so we started to brainstorm ideas. Let us recreate it for you. <gasps> we can beatbox the whole speech. Oh, totally. Okay. <coughs> Hello, Emma Wilder. We are here to tell you that you guys finally made it to this point. Congratulations and... Uh, uh, well. <laughs> well, obviously, it didn't work. <laughs> then, we thought about pointedly singing the whole speech. So long, farewell, we don't say goodbye. I didn't like that idea either. So in the end, we figured that we shouldn't distract with a big show, but just focus on the content. We realized that there are three aspects of Emma education that we feel strongly and want to share with you. The first one of these three points, single sex education. Why would you go to an all-girl school? <laughs> that sounds so weird. Why did we come? Were we crazy? <laughs> there are all kinds of conceptions, some true, about being at an all-girl school. We will hit on nine. Number one, you will be in first of boys. <laughs> the, bo uh, the only boys on campus are in the kitchen. <laughs> And number two, there are no boys grabbing, there are no boys to share ideas with in the classroom. But there are no boys dominating discussions or competing for leadership or opportunities against you. The chance to participate in theater, theater technical crew, 
Science Olympia, math competitions, and solar panel constructions are usually taken by boys, but at Emma, they are all run by girls. Number four, there is no one judging you in class, no matter what you say. Definitely, I have felt free to talk about controversial or sensitive stuff in class. AP Psych people, remember when we were discussing about Freud? You got it. <laughs> okay, let's keep moving. Okay, number five, there are no boys around to distract you or to generate rumors. Number six, it's perfectly normal to wear pajamas in the dining hall. <coughs> Though sometimes the pajama style is a little. <laughs> right. We don't have to feel self-conscious about what we were wearing. In fact, we love pajamas in the dining hall. Number seven, it's really hard to find an irresponsible teacher. Yet some people wish they had a teacher that doesn't work, doesn't sign works. But at Emma, it is the opposite. We are not just we're not just talking about in the class, but just think of Miss Mayer. Remember her bringing home baked ice cupcakes to a AP Bio morning review session every Friday morning at 7 a.m. Number eight, you can try, but you find you can't be anyone but your true self. Number nine, no one is mean but damn supportive. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was feeling really low for a longer time when I ever had. House parents, no matter they have the duty of taking care of me or not, were and always are here as my real mother in a foreign country. Because of these nine reasons above, I, my life has been changed forever. I now have a bunch of friends who I can call sisters forever, and I now have a place to call my second home. I now have many guardians in this foreign country who I can always retreat. No. Remember, we had three points to share with you today. Let's move on to the second point. <laughs> weirdness. <laughs> embrace your embrace your weirdness. Remember the last video one one and I did this year? I'm sure you all thought that we were the weirdest people on campus, but that's okay because you guys were the one we thought that was the weirdest people here <laughs> when we first came to Emma. I was very surprised by the things people do here. It is very different from what I experienced back home in China. For example, everyone at Emma bakes cake all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I had never had a history teacher who is also a softball coach, because in Taiwan not every academic teacher is athletic. I had never seen people dressed up as grapes or Hannah Montana. <laughs> I have never realized that a piece of triangular-shaped grass could mean so much to a school's tradition. <laughs> and thank you, juniors, for letting us taking a piece with us. Those of you who don't know the story can ask us later. I have never seen a real-life Quidditch team, and had never taken a, a school day off just because the principal said so. <laughs> Gradually, we realized that we have been deeply influenced by Emma's weirdness. We are now part of this weird community, and this is not only for international students. We are sure that every one of you out there found something unexpected when you first came to Emma. Some other high schools may think the only way to be cool is to conform. I mean, what is wrong with being weird? So what if seniors took a week off to prepare for the revels? So what if we dress up to go to cross gates? <laughs> Nothing. We should be proud of being weird because it means that we are unique. Therefore, no matter where you go to college or where you are later on in life, remember, don't be afraid of doing things that may seem absurd to other people. Don't lose courage that we have here at Emma. Instead, do whatever your hearts tell you to do and embrace, kiss, hug, and love everyone's weirdness because weirdness really means yourself. And that goes for everyone here, not just Emma students. <laughs> well, embracing your uniqueness, remember that you need to be responsible for your choices, and that's point number three: making choices. Hmm. Let's hear what she says. <laughs> the key to making choices is not about whether or not 
that choice is the perfect choice. Instead, it's being able to take responsibility of the choice you've made. If you have faith of your choice and are ready to face any consequences of that decision, any choice will be the right one for you. Before I came to Emma, I have heard this cliche over a hundred times, but it still clicked me when I came to the realization myself. I know for every Emma girl, to cling or not to cling is always a question. <laughs> From my junior year, I have learned a lesson that if I don't clean up my room, nobody is going to do it for me. And that if I don't, it will be just me who has to bear the messiness. You are probably hearing this as a metaphor, as metaphoric, and it is. But for many of us, it's actually literal too. <laughs> What you learn from travel things such as cleaning your room can be applied to a major decision. I know for a fact that when I chose to study abroad, I had to anticipate standing the loneliness and stressfulness by myself. No matter how hard the life was going to be, I would not regret my decision and return to Taiwan, but would tough it out, taking the responsibility of my choice. I believe Peggy's word will resonate with everyone who once had to decide whether to come to Emma. Underclass women, remember your determination on the first day of school about how you will rock through your high school? And our classmates, as we are stepping out of the gate of high school, we will always have to make choices at every single split, in college, in society, and in life. Yes, remember, your choice, your responsibility. And now, class of 2012, we have a challenge for you. Whether or not you decide to take it is your choice. It is something you will only do at an orgo school, this orgo school. Yeah. And it's weird, but it's unique. So seniors, as we count to three, we would like you to shout out, we are golden, as loud as you can. Are you ready? Oh, sorry. <laughs> as loud <laughs> as you can to mark the end of your high school career and the beginning of life <coughs> in the real world. Are you? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. All right. One, two, three. We are golden! <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and especially Miss Carson, who had helped us through throughout the process. Congratulations. Peace out. YOLO. Tee. Before we stand for the words of the alma mater and the words of farewell, I would like to remind all of us of one last very important tradition. It's our custom to permit the faculty a final goodbye to the young women they have mentored. At the end of the ceremony, the graduates will recess and form a line at the back of the senior triangle. We ask that friends and family remain, refrain from greeting the graduates until after the faculty have said their final goodbye. In fact, let me suggest this is a wonderful moment to take a picture. Would you join us now in singing the alma mater?
Across the United States today and throughout the next few weeks, thousands of students will graduate from high school. Like you, they will be at turns nostalgic, sentimental, jubilant, teary, and proud. Like you, they will have dressed especially for the occasion. And like you, they will have made friends that they will cherish for a lifetime. However, and this is the big however, none of them will have what you have an alma mater whose founder is forever etched in the annals of U.S. history because of the vision she had for the future of young women. That is yours and yours alone. Be proud of this legacy and in all you do, carry her vision with you. I leave you with these words from Madam Willard. Go in the name of God, prosper and prove a pillar in the cause of womanhood. said they wanted somebody um, wise and somebody sexy, so we invited her to be wise and we could say. <laughs> well, I got the voice in the way. There you go. <laughs> No, because we don't go through the, unless you want to go through the way on wall. No, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. We're not supposed to. I don't know. Trudy said we had the option. They didn't know how to operate. I'm not doing it. They don't know. They don't know me, so. And besides, 
outside the line. Thank you. 